Good morning once again, and would like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. We have been looking in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, and so we continue today in chapter 6. Last week we looked at verses 1 and 2. We'll read those once again so that we keep our train of thought, and then we'll pick up with verses 3 through 10 and be looking at those today. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along. It'll be on your screen as well. As we read this, again, I would remind us this is the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit who can make it come alive to us. And so I would ask us to invite the Holy Spirit into our presence, to speak to our hearts and to our lives and give us insights and understanding and application from this Word. And so as we read, here's what we find. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin may be done away with then we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all but the life he lives, he lives to God. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you and I just ask for the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I confess, Lord, I cannot do this in the flesh. I need you. And so, Lord, I would ask that you will take this word and that you will speak to our hearts and give us understanding. Draw us closer to you. Let us hear what it is we're needing to hear from you today. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one here that they will hear from your Holy Spirit. I ask for your cleansing, that you would make me fit for your use. And more than anything, I'm asking that you will be glorified and honored in what we do with this word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I think that at some point... Every one of us goes through an identity crisis. Sometimes we say it in things like this. I don't know who I am. Or, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Or, what's the meaning of life? Or, what is the meaning of my life? And I think one of the favorites that we hear people use today is that I've just got to find myself. And so I have to ask the question, what is it that is behind this universal identity crisis? And I believe the answer is that we have forgotten who we are. And I think that is illustrated so well in the Disney movie, The Lion King. I don't know if you've seen that. When our girls were little, I mean, that's when The Lion King came out. We went to the theaters to see that. After the video came out, it was a VHS, if that wants to date you a little bit. Uh, and so we bought the VHS, and I could not tell you how many times I have seen The Lion King. And so if you have younger kids or grandkids, you likely have seen The Lion King. But if not, let me just introduce you to this a little bit. One of the characters that you meet in this movie is Rafiki. And Rafiki is a mandrel. Now, I know some people call him a baboon. He's not. 
is a mandrel. But if you don't know what a mandrel is, just imagine a baboon then, okay. But he's a colorful baboon. And so Rafiki is Simba's spiritual guide. Now Simba's the, basically the center of the movie. It's the Lion King, and so he becomes the Lion King in this. Only Simba loses his dad when he is young, and Simba loses his way. And so Rafiki is there as Simba's spiritual guide, because when we meet Simba, he is on the verge of becoming a young adult lion. And so to help him find his way, Rafiki goes to him, and he invites him to come and look in a pool of water where he will see his father. And so Simba wants to see his father. He follows him to this pool of water. He looks down into that pool of water, and then he says, that's not my father. That's just my reflection. And then Rafiki says, look harder. And speaking of Simba's father, Rafiki says, you see, he lives in you. And at that point, Simba hears his father's voice. He looks up and he says, Simba, you have forgotten me. You have forgotten who you are. And so you have forgotten me. Simba's despondent at that and he says, I'm not who I used to be. At that point, his father encourages him saying, remember who you are. You are my son. Remember who you are. That is the advice that we are needing to hear because we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten that we were created in the image of our Father. We were created in the image of God. We were created to be in a relationship with Him. And because of sin, we were separated from God. And the image was marred, causing us to forget who we are. And that's the good news of the gospel, because it's through Jesus Christ that our relationship with the Father can be restored. And so Paul is inviting us to remember who we are, to see where our identity lies. And as believers, our identity is in Christ. Remember who you are. You are my child. Remember who you are. This is our true identity. And so Paul illustrates this for us. And it's amazing, but he uses baptism to illustrate our identity in Christ. We begin reading in verse 3 of uh, chapter 6 in Romans. He says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now it's obvious with what Paul is talking about here, this is a baptism that is more potent than water. And I advice, remember the context here, he's illustrating that great truth laid down in chapter 6 verse 2, that we died to sin. This is how we know we died to sin. Before coming to Christ, our identity was in Adam. And consequently, that meant that we were in bondage to sin and death. And so since Adam, sin and death have reigned. We all sin and we all end up dying. But through faith in Jesus, we are now identified in Christ. Therefore, instead of death, we have life. Instead of bondage to sin, we have deliverance from it. And so whatever happened in Adam has been canceled out by Christ. And so the point is, we are no longer slaves to sin. And no water can do that. 
Paul is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what John was talking about, the forerunner of Jesus. Even before Jesus came on the scene, John was proclaiming, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so he says, we were baptized into Christ. And so through the Holy Spirit, when we come to know Jesus, he identifies us in Christ. That becomes our new identity. Remember who you are. We are his. I am in him. He is in me. See, we're no longer identified in Adam, but Christ. Now, Paul talks about this when he writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians when he says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. The one spirit is the Holy Spirit. And so when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Now, it's interesting. Paul indicates that we should already know this. Did you catch what he said in verse 3? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Don't you know? Now, how would we know that? And this is where water baptism comes in. And water baptism is a shadow. It's a reflection. It is a representation of what the Holy Spirit has done in us. In other words, water baptism is to help us understand what it means to be identified in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And so it works like this. The moment that I believe in Jesus and receive him as my Lord and my Savior, it is at that moment that the Holy Spirit baptizes me into Christ and I am completely identified in him. That becomes my identity. And so that means that whatever happened to Christ has happened to you. And so just as Jesus died and was buried and was raised again into a newness of life, then when you were baptized by the Spirit, you were baptized into his death, you were baptized into his burial, and you were raised with him into a newness of life. And so the water baptism is a shadow of the reality. Now, I want you to listen to me. I don't think the mode of baptism is important. In other words, I don't think it matters how you're baptized. If you want to be sprinkled, you can be sprinkled. If you want to pour it on you, you can have it poured on you. If you want to be dipped in water, you can be dipped in water. If you want to be dipped seven times, you can be dipped seven times. I just don't think that it matters. Now, I think it does matter that you follow Christ in baptism, but not for salvation, but out of obedience. And also, it's a beautiful picture. Now, the one that really illustrates what Paul is talking about here is what we often refer to as immersion. Now, I say we refer to it because that's erroneous. I've not yet met a person who believes in immersion in water. They just say they do. Because when something is immersed, it is overwhelmed and remains overwhelmed. There's actually two words for baptism that are used in the Bible. One of them means to dip, and that's what people mean by being immersed. They're actually dipped in water. Now, I have baptized a lot of people in water that way, and I'm going to tell you I never immersed one of them. They're not there. I am proud to say I brought them all up out of the water. Didn't lose one there. Now, if I were to immerse them, I would have shoved them down there and I'd have just held them and I'd finally got me a block or something to hold them down there. Because, I mean, that's the only way. What we do is we dip them. But here's the beautiful part of it. When that word baptized is used about the Holy Spirit, it means to be immersed. We are immersed in Christ. We are in Him. We don't come out of Him with this. But now, let's go back to the water baptism where we dip people in water. Because it actually paints this picture that Paul is talking about in this passage. 
And it shows how we're identified in Christ because when you come to Christ and you've confessed him as your Lord and you're going to follow him in water baptism and you go into the waters, what that is saying is that I have been identified in the death of Christ. My old self was crucified with Jesus. Now, what do you do when a body dies? You bury it. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's often referred to in baptism as being a water grave. Because why? You come into the water, the old self is dead in Christ, and so you bury the old self. We don't leave it there because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He came out, so they're raised up out of the waters as a picture of being raised in Jesus and his resurrection into this newness of life. And that's the theme of this chapter in Romans, that we live a new life. And the reason that we can live a new life is because we are identified in Jesus. Paul also says we are united with Christ in verse 5. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. In other words, if you died with Christ, you've been raised with Christ. If you've been raised with Christ, you have been raised into a newness of life. And this goes back to answer the question, shall we go on sinning? And the answer was absolutely not. Why? Because we have been raised to a new life. This is now my new identity in Jesus. And so we're totally united with him. And when we are totally united in Jesus, that means that everything that is his is ours. And so we actually have the power of Christ, the life of Christ that flows through us. And so it is a life that is fully shared. Now to help us, Paul takes us a little bit deeper here as to what it means to die with Christ. In verse 6 following. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That is that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And so the old self was crucified with Christ. We were identified in his death. Now, here's that, how that's so easy to see. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To pay my sin debt. And so the Holy Spirit, even though I am not yet been born, or you identifies us in the death of Jesus. He's paying what? Your debt. You're identified in his death by the Holy Spirit. And so that means that when we spend our whole life trying to crucify the old self, we're just trying to crucify what's already dead. You don't have to crucify the old self. The old self is what I was in Adam, and that was born in sin, under condemnation, and under the wrath of God. But we're never told in the Bible to crucify the old flesh. Why? Because it's already done. That happened when you were identified in Christ. It's taken place. We died to sin. Now, when the old self was crucified... That meant that sin was rendered powerless in the body. Now, if you remember last week, we looked at our humanity, that we are a composition here. We called it the trichotomy, the three parts of our humanity, body, soul, and spirit. If you remember, we learned that what's going on is that the body simply is mirroring what is going on in your spirit and in your soul. And under the old self, the body was enslaved to sin. It couldn't have done good if it wanted to. It couldn't behave. Why? Because it was a slave to sin. Whatever slave tells it to do, it's going to do. But now in Christ, the body has been rendered powerless. That means we do not have to live in sin. It means we do not have to give in to temptation 
because this body of sin has been rendered powerless. And so that's why Paul writes that we should no longer be slaves to sin. In other words, Jesus has freed us from the bondage of sin. We do not have to sin. We do not have to continue living in sin. We choose. And we can choose because the old self was crucified. Now, Paul says that it's like being a dead man. Now, here's the thing. Have you ever seen a dead man sin? I mean, you can have people that have sinned every way that there is to sin, and when they're dead, they no longer sin. In fact, there's no temptation for them even. Let me just illustrate, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone's addiction with this because, I mean, probably most of us have some kind of addiction, so don't think I'm singling you out if this happens to be something you've struggled with. But just imagine the man who has been addicted to alcohol. And then when he dies, and I've actually seen this, they will take and put in his casket a bottle of whiskey. Do you know he's not even tempted to open it? Won't happen. I mean, if they left that bottle in there, it's still there. He didn't drink it. Why? Because he's dead. Well, he says, our old self is dead. We do not have to give in to sin and temptation. It does not have power over us since the old self was crucified. Now, not only have we died with Christ, he says that means we also live with Christ in verse 8 and following. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death has no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so the result of dying with Christ is that we live with Christ. And it's interesting, the word that Paul uses here in the Greek means to live with someone or to continue to live together. You see, just as Christ was raised into a newness of life, we have been raised into a newness of life. That means right now, we can experience the power of Christ who dwells within us. Let's go back. Let's remember this. The moment you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. He takes up residence. As my pastor would say, he nails the door shut. He's not going anywhere. He is there to stay, and he is releasing that resurrection power of Christ into our life. Now, this is a power the world doesn't know. The world is power hungry. And there's nothing this world can do to raise a dead body. That tells you what resurrection power is like. This is more powerful than the most powerful atomic weapon we can ever have. This is a power that raises the dead. And this is the power that lives in you. Now, our only problem is appropriating it. It's there. You know Christ, the power is there. The question is, am I relying on that power? Now, this is what Jesus was talking about when he says, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have come so that you can live victoriously. I've come so that you can have an abundant life here and now. But it's not just here and now. It also includes that promise of eternal life because that word meant that we will continue to live together. We will continue to live together in Christ for all eternity. Just as death has no dominion over Jesus, it will have no dominion over us. Because he lives, we too will live. Now, as you know, we've just experienced the death in our family. And here's what I know in that. As soon as my mother-in-law took her last breath on this earth, she exhaled, and her next time she inhaled was in the presence of Jesus. It is that quick. 
You leave this life, you go right into the next life. It's called eternal life. You have it now. The body dies, but we don't die. It has no dominion over us. He lives and so we live. And the life that he lives, he says, he lives to God. And that's what we've been empowered to do. This newness of life we have is to be living our life unto God. Now I want you to listen to me. It can sound so easy. And it's not. I'm not saying it's easy. We talked about this last week. It's re-educating our soul. Our spirit's a new creation. It's re-educating our body. How to operate under this new life that we have. And this new identity that we have in Christ. And in the flesh it's impossible. But because he lives in us. We have everything we need to live victoriously. And we can be victorious over sin. It's our new identity. Remember who you are. Now, there are three questions that I think we really need to look at in our own life. The first one is this, and this actually has two different questions in one. Am I walking in newness of life? Now that may mean that I've never come to know Jesus Christ, so how can I be walking in a newness of life? And if you've never come to know Jesus, by the way, he loves you, he died for you, he paid your sin debt, he wants you to come to him, he invites you to come to him, and it doesn't matter what you've done. He will welcome you and forgive you and love you. And the moment you do that, then you experience this coming of the Holy Spirit that we've been talking about into your life. Doesn't mean you're going to feel it, but it doesn't mean it's any less real. It happens. Now, the other part of that is, though, if I've already come to know Christ, am I walking in newness of life. In other words, have I come to the place where I am appropriating the power that has been given to me and that lives in me? Now that's something we learn to do and that's what we'll be looking at in Romans next. It's called sanctification. How we learn to live in the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to make us victorious in this. But I'll tell you, it works like this and I've shared this with you before. Using friendship as an example really talks about what it means. If you don't know me, then we're strangers, right? Got that? Pretty simple. Once we are introduced, we become acquaintances. Now, if you decide you like me, then we may become friends in that. Because whether we know it or not, subconsciously, that's what we're doing. Anytime there's an acquaintance, you know, and let's be real. Haven't you met some people that you went away from and said, I don't really care if I ever see them again. Don't tell me their name. But, yeah. I mean, let's be real. There are some people you don't want to be friends with. And then there are some people that are your friends, but they're not really your good friends. And so as you start moving into this area, they start getting smaller, don't they? I mean, we have lots of acquaintances. And by the way, that's what we call friending people on Facebook. So many of these people are just acquaintances. Oh, I know who you are. But then others are actually friends, and some are really good friends in this, and then others are really good friends. I mean, we're really close. Well, that's what Jesus is inviting us into, because when you've been introduced to Jesus, you're an acquaintance, and when you're introduced to Jesus, you're deciding, what am I going to do with him? Do I want to be friends with Jesus? And if I want to be friends with Jesus is when I actually confess him as my Lord and my Savior, and the Holy Spirit baptizes me into Christ. But then it becomes a growing point in that where you move from being a friend to being a good friend with Jesus. Now, how do you get good friends? You have friends that you spend time with. In other words, if we're a friend and we never spend any time with each other, we're not going to be good friends. You do it by spending time with them. And so it's spending time with Jesus and it's growing and developing our relationship with him. And then eventually Jesus can be our best friend if we don't hold him off on this. He wants you as his best friend, but do you want him as your best friend? And if you do, you continue growing in him where that becomes the most important relationship in your life. And that's how you appropriate this resurrection power of Christ into your life. It's by walking with him daily. Daily. 
Now, the next question then is, am I free from the bondage of sin? Now, that's the same formula really in all of this. Because if I'm not appropriating that power, sin is still going to have power over me, even though it doesn't. Satan's going to tell you it has power. And here's the thing. We talked about this last week. The things that we're tempted to do are the things that Satan knows has an attraction to us, a power in us. And so the only way to overcome that is to have something more powerful. And Jesus is more powerful than any temptation that you could ever deal with in your life. We don't have to give in to it. We don't have to be in bondage to sin. And so am I completely identified in Christ? In other words, am I moving on my journey to where I am growing into an intimate relationship with Christ, where I recognize that this is my true identity? I think all so often we forget who we are. And when we forget who we are, we forget who he is. And so what we need to do is hear those words that Simba's father spoke to him. You are my child. Remember who you are. Let's pray together. Lord, we come and we thank you and we praise you for your word. We just ask that you will take it and continue to use it in our hearts and in our lives. We pray, Lord, that we will recognize where our true identity lies in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn this morning, the altar is open. And uh, if you just want to come and pray, you can do that. If you're wanting uh, me to pray with you, you just come to me. I'll be happy to kneel with you and pray. Uh, if you're wanting to come to know Jesus, Jesus invites you to come. We'd love for you to come. Just share that with me. And we'll share with you while we, what you need to do. And you can leave here knowing you have been identified completely in Christ. So let's all stand as we sing.